Moving on then to the presidency in particular of the United States, one of your major theses, I think, is that the position is not now what it started as a couple of hundred years ago. And the title of the course suggests this, but what do you see as the fundamental differences? And we'll, we'll get into the specifics, but- Great question. This is actually the whole reason I wrote the book. You're asking the best question because people use this word as if it's always meant the same thing in an ahistorical way, right? And they say, oh, if we could just bring George Washington back. You've heard people say this, or we just had Abraham Lincoln again, all our problems would be solved. That's an absolute nonsense. Those guys would fail completely because the presidency meant something totally different uh, in their time. The office was created to be a small office that did not make policy, but actually brought the country together and executed policy made by others. Over time, the office has grown for a variety of reasons that I describe, but I'll just touch on three of them right now. One, the office has grown because the power of the United States internationally has grown. Uh, the United States is the most powerful foreign policy actor in the world, the most powerful military actor in the world. None of that was conceivable to the founding fathers. We were a small country without a standing military. And for the president to have the ability, not just to send soldiers around the world, to use drones in the way he uses drones, to send resources. Uh, and that power is really not wrapped into uh, many of the other elements of our democracy. It's grown and it's attached itself to the presidency. So the international power of the US is one element. At home, our country has become so much larger and more complex that the president administers many programs. Think about our current debates about student loans and loan forgiveness, that this is even an issue that a president would deal with, which was unthinkable to the founding fathers as well. So you have domestic complexity the range of institutions. Think about during the pandemic, the health decisions the president had to make. And then the third element, which actually turns out, I think, to be the most important, is that as the power has grown internationally and um, become more complex at home, more and more people work for the president. The presidency has now become a bureaucracy. And so presidents, it's really interesting to me, are elected now on what they say they're going to do, but most of them have no idea how to actually do it. Because to get it done, you have to manage a huge bureaucracy. It's like someone coming to a university and having all these great ideas about a university, but not knowing the first thing about how a university is actually run. Most people who run for presidency don't understand the complexity of the presidential bureaucracy. And as I try to show in the book, that has a huge effect on what happens uh, in recent years on what presidents do. Hmm. Now, you mentioned that Washington and Lincoln would have failed, <laughs> that the office was made to bring the country together rather than make policy. Is another reason that the presidency is impossible today because the country is so divided? So it, even if Trump or Biden had perfectly fulfilled the the promises they made, half the country would have been very, very upset. Yeah, and, and, and I, I'm not sure that's even a new phenomenon. Okay. I, yeah, I was going to ask whether that was whether the country was as divided back then. We've always been very divided. We've always and the founding fathers understood that. And that's the whole reason why slavery is in the Constitution because they couldn't agree to get it out. Right? Half the country had slavery, half did. Right? So we've always been divided. In fact, our strength is our pluralism. Right? That we don't have one religion. That we don't have one way of thinking. We need to remember that. I never want to live in a society where everyone agrees. In fact, I'm the kind of person when I'm in a room and everyone agrees, I tend to want to disagree because I don't trust everyone. If they all agree, there must be something wrong if they're all in agreement. So we've always been divided. But what's made it impossible to, to the point of your question, Robinson, is that um, as more of the public has been mobilized, as in fact, the government act comes to represent more interests, it's harder to balance them. So it was easier for Washington or Lincoln because quite frankly, you had a smaller electorate and you had a smaller range of people to manage. Uh, for In Lincoln's time, right, uh, even in the North, in most states, women didn't vote. And in the states that had free African-American citizens, they generally didn't vote. So it's a smaller electorate to manage. It's a much more diverse country now. And what social media has done is it's empowered every small group of people to get their voice out there and rile people up 
Uh, and that's what's really hard to manage. It's hard for a president to speak truth to the public when there's some group on social media that has lots of followers that can spread lies or spread whatever it is in reaction to what he says as soon as he speaks. Hmm. Is this the phenomenon that I think you refer to in the book as mission creep, that the president just gets increasingly, as, as our nation has grown, pulled in so many different directions? I think so. And I think it's exactly what we're talking about here. As the office becomes more complex and there are more groups to serve, the urge presidents have, Bill Clinton is a classic example of this, is to give someone, a, a give everyone something, to sort of give a little bit to every single group, right? We would call this log rolling in a congressional context. The problem is you can't do that. You can do that maybe as a mayor. You can do that maybe as a university president. Uh, but once you become president of the United States, there are too many groups. And what I try to show in the book is that presidents try to do that. And instead of building consensus, what they end up doing is empowering more and more critics and they lose uh, a concentrated focus sense on what they want to accomplish. My argument is that the office would be less impossible if presidents lowered expectations and said, look, there are only a few things we're going to accomplish. I'm going to work on getting these things done and getting these people together to get these things done. But I can't do many of the other things you want me to do. 